Time, without question, is essential. But at the end of the day, one second is just one second, right? The clock's hand moves along by a few degrees, end of story. Far from it. We are actually on the verge of a major breakthrough in timekeeping, a revolution that will have an enormous impact on our way of navigation, our financial markets and the speed of our internet. An invention that could even bring us closer to deciphering the fundamental mysteries of our planet and our universe. I'm talking about optical clocks. Today we unpack how they work, what makes them different from standard atomic clocks and everything else you need to know about how time is made. Welcome to Dr. Watson. Time used to be something very subjective, not only in the sense that Einstein described. Every place on Earth had its own time measured by the position of the Sun. Although the standard time as we know it today was agreed upon as early as 1884, today's technology for measuring time has only been defining the standard second since 1967, with the help of quantum physics and atomic clocks. At the heart of every atomic clock are a vibrating quartz oscillator emitting microwaves and a detector that counts those waves. After a fixed number of oscillations, the detector advances the clock by one second. And if all quartz oscillators were identical and vibrated at a reliable constant weight, we'd be done. But unfortunately, they don't. That's why we have an additional control mechanism that uses cesium atoms, which, as far as we know, are all identical. They are being evaporated in an oven and sent through a vacuum so that they are exposed to as little environmental fluctuations as possible. Because of their quantum properties, the atoms can have two different so-called energy states. Using a magnet, only those atoms with a lower energy level are passed into the microwave cavity at the heart of the clock. If the waves are tuned to a very specific radiation cycle that corresponds to the atoms, they interact with them. And this is exactly what the researchers use to their advantage. Every element on our Earth has characteristic frequencies at which these interactions take place. In atomic clocks, we choose one of those frequencies to drive an electron transition between the two different quantum states of cesium atoms. This frequency is always the same for each individual atom, no matter the circumstances. So the researchers tune the cycle of the microwaves to the frequency that makes as many of these cesium atoms as possible transition to a higher energy level. And that tuning is, is done by spectroscopy. This is Niels Huntemann. He's one of the experts working on optical clocks for the Physikalisch-Technische Bundesanstalt, PTB, in Braunschweig. And he explained everything to me on site. We perform spectroscopy of cesium atoms with a microwave local oscillator and we tune its frequency so that the oscillator is in resonance with the atomic transition. And then the atomic transition uh, frequency um, uh, allows us to extract, for example, the, the second um, as, a, as a unit of time. When the quartz oscillator and with it the clock begins to lose its beat, the researchers will notice, because now the frequency is no longer in resonance with the atoms, meaning that fewer of them change their energy state. A detector at the other end registers this change and readjusts the microwave radiation so that it is back in sync. This feedback loop in the system makes sure that the oscillator is vibrating at always the exact same rate, which a display unit finally converts into a time that we can read. The time on your smartphones is being synchronized with 400 of such atomic clocks, as well as the rotation of the Earth. In Germany it's the PTB which sends us the current time by radio transmission. And that's also where I met Niels, who was kind enough to tell me everything I wanted to know about clocks and how they work. By the way, the clock room in the PTB where we filmed is pretty cool. Not only is it completely shielded from outside radiation with copper walls, the room also has its own massive foundation that weighs several tons and is separated from the outer walls, so that no vibrations in the surrounding area can disrupt the timepieces. After all, Germany does in fact contribute about 50% to the Coordinated Universal Time UTC. Think about that. Half of the international time is made in this one room. And I was just allowed to walk freely in there. I wonder what would have happened if I accidentally tripped and ripped out a cable or something. 
Okay, but back to atomic clocks and the question as to why research on optical clocks is relevant. The simple answer, being able to count over 9 billion oscillations per second is simply not enough for scientists. They want to be even more precise. Just like we strive for more and more pixel resolution in photos, researchers are trying to resolve time into increasingly smaller increments. One advantage of this is that the error rate is reduced. If you have 1 million pixels in a row and one of them is faulty, the picture error is greater than with a row of a billion pixels. And the same is true for clocks, which become more and more reliable the finer their resolution gets. The best microwave clocks reach systematic uncertainties in the 10 to minus 16 range, and that corresponds to about 100 seconds over the age of the universe. The optical clock ticks about 100,000 times faster, and that higher pace uh, allows us to measure more accurately. The accuracy is presently about a factor of 100 um, better than the standard cesium clock. So that would mean only about one second deviation over 13 billion years. That is pretty precise. But the hope is that we'll eventually get even more precise. Given that an optical clock ticks about 100,000 times faster than a standard atomic clock, we're potentially looking at 100,000 times the accuracy. This would greatly benefit a number of areas in our lives. Our GPS navigation is only one example. The global positioning system is made up of numerous satellites orbiting Earth while constantly transmitting their position and time code. Our mobile phone, for example, can then calculate how far away from a satellite it is based on the time it took the signal to travel to the phone. Combined with signals from other satellites, it can then triangulate its position with an accuracy of a few meters. Now, the more accurately our GPS receivers know how many fractions of a second have passed, the more accurately they can determine their location. So instead of an accuracy of a few meters, optical atomic clocks would allow positioning down to the centimeter. This is great for a number of professional applications, but it could also come in handy for us. In the future, navigation systems in cars could be able to tell which exact lane I am currently driving in, and that I should actually be in another lane in order to make the right turn coming up. Similarly, our financial markets and data transmission networks already work with fractions of a second to process as transactions or to send data packets. The finer they can subdivide a second, the faster they can work. I would say that high-tech uh, life today requires uh, precise timing information, for example in communication or in synchronization of networks, navigation. Even Einstein himself would certainly be thrilled about these ultra-precise clocks. After all, he is the founding father of the famous general theory of relativity. It states that time behaves relative to the strength of a gravitational potential, that is, the proximity of a large mass, like the Earth. The greater that mass and the closer you are to it, the slower time passes, compared to a point farther away from this mass. Normally, you don't really experience this kind of relativity directly, but researchers have been able to prove this connection here on Earth. A timepiece on a high mountain actually goes faster than one at sea level. If technology allowed us to subdivide time even more precisely, this difference in the clock speed could be measured more precisely as well. And this in turn means that we can use that ultra-precise measurement to calculate the exact difference in height between them. Which, if you really think about it, is a pretty cool way to measuring heights, by stopping the time. <laughs> But optical clocks can not only improve our systems of measurements. Scientists hope to use the extreme precision and stability of optical clocks to check whether natural constants are really as constant as we believe. Let's hope they are. Okay, this all sounds great, I'm in. So how exactly can we make our clocks even more accurate? Well, on the surface, an optical clock basically works like an ordinary atomic clock. There is an oscillator emitting waves, a detector that counts them, and an atomic control unit that readjusts the oscillator when it is no longer in time. The big difference is that the microwave oscillator is replaced by an ultra-stable laser. Its frequency is a lot, and I mean a lot higher, than the microwave spectrum, making the entire clockwork a bit more complex. Because first of all, we need to replace the cesium atoms with a different kind of atom, in order to be able to check the laser's reliability. These new atoms must react to the much higher frequencies of the laser waves. There are several promising candidates at this time, but no winner yet. 
What they all have in common though is that they change to another quantum state upon hitting the waves emitted by the laser. With this ultra-stable laser we interrogate again an atomic transition but now it's an optical transition. The result of that uh, interrogation is then used to feed back to the ultra-stable laser and tune its frequency to be resonant again with the atomic transition frequency. Uh, since we cannot easily measure that uh, very, very high frequency, uh, we need a frequency comp to divide down the optical frequency to a microwave frequency that can easily be measured by microwave counters. And this is one of the biggest challenges of optical clocks. The laser's oscillation rate is simply too fast to be read out electronically. This is where the frequency comp comes in. This component uses very short and extremely accurate laser pulses to generate a comp of rainbow-colored optical lines that are all the same distance from each other. Think of it as a ruler for high frequencies. With those lines, researchers are able to determine a light's frequency with extremely high accuracy. As soon as the clock laser enters the comm, its wavelength can be compared to the perfectly defined wavelengths inside. In doing so, they interact with each other, dividing the original frequency down to a new third frequency that is within the measurable microwave spectrum. What follows is just simple math. Since the new measurable frequency C is the result of A minus B, and because I know which frequencies A and C have, I can simply calculate which frequency B must have. In this equation, B is our original clock laser, the thing that we want to find out. A is the model frequency of the frequency comm, and C is the new frequency. This is how, without measuring it directly, we receive the laser's exact cycle and can use it as the basis of our new and more accurate time measurement. Of course, besides the research application, where we are searching, for example, for temporal variations of fundamental constants, of course, there are applications possible um, wherever we are nowadays using standard microwave clocks. A new standard time defined by optical clocks is not yet reality, though. For this to happen, the International Panel on Units of Measurement in Paris would first have to redefine what a second is. Only then would we be able to measure one second more accurately than before. This is certainly under discussion, but optical clocks are still primarily used in research laboratories and have yet to be introduced to the general market. That's why Niels believes it's still too early to redefine our time measurement. Another problem is that in order to take that step, we would have to decide on a standard atom to be used in these kind of clocks. Right now, there are still quite a few different candidates that are worth considering. In conclusion, it will still take a little while before our way of keeping time finally reaches the next level. But the practical tests are already underway. The German PTB has started test runs for time-based altitude measurements. And the company Menlo Systems has developed a frequency comm that has successfully been sent to space. The results are indeed promising. Dare I say, we can look forward to better times. Okay, bad puns aside, this is a perfect segue to thank Menlo Systems for their support with this video. Michael May, Managing Director of Menlo Systems, made it possible for me and my team to drive to the PTB in Braunschweig and enter the sacred copper-plated clock hall in order to bring you this video right here. By the way, should you be interested in building your own optical clock, Menlo Systems offers both their configurable frequency comm and clock laser technologies on their website. Just follow the link in the video description down below. I would also like to thank Niels Huntemann very much who was kind enough to show me around and answer all of my questions. Also, you can follow the link in the video description to find a German version of this video right here in case you have any German friends or colleagues who might be interested in this topic. Guten Tag! Other than that, stay curious. Until next time, you're Dr. Watson.